Hi, this is gonna be a long video. <laughs> I like coffee with my coffee. I'm a no bullshit kind of girl. No room for creamer or that vanilla stuff. Hello, darlings. My name is Isabel. Welcome back to my channel. And today, we're going back to Manderly, Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. That is a topic that everyone in the book community is talking about. Okay, let me rephrase that. Not only the book community, but apparently the whole internet. In case you don't know, it became a thing because Netflix just released a remake of the original film who's beloved by everyone. And of course, the internet is always looking for something to criticize. And to be honest, a remake is always a very meaty topic because you can compare the original source and then the first movie and then the remake. And there's a lot of aspects you can look into it. You can look into fashion. You can look at the photography. You can look at the narration and the characters. Today, we're gonna talk about the narration of course because I want to talk about what the 2020 adaptation does right and what I think were missed opportunities and things that were just fell flat compared to the book. I'm not gonna talk about Hitchcock's movie because I don't know anything about film but I am a book enthusiast. Only me with a degree in literature feeling awkward about my authority on books honestly. So before the spoilers begin, I'll give you the short version of what the book is about so you can go on your merry way and read the book and then come back. Rebecca is an English Gothic novel from 1938. It follows the story of a young woman who marries a wealthy widower. They meet in Monte Carlo where she is working for an American old lady as her companion. She quickly falls in love with this guy and then they move to their family home, Manderly, and that's where the actual story begins. There, the new bride has to wake up from her dream in Monte Carlo and the honeymoon and everything and comes to term with her reality. Manderly is not gonna be a happy place for her. And it, she needs to cope with the immensity of the house the staff and just the title that she herself is holding now. Our protagonist and narrator is a young woman, as I said, with a lot of insecurities and her position as a new bride exposes. This is not an, I don't know, Elizabeth Bennet, who is like always going back and forth with Mr. Darcy or even a Jane Earl who's always very proudful and stands up and says even if I'm poor even if I'm not your class I'm not trash well this lady is not like that she does feel like trash she feels like an imposter and in my perspective it feels real her biggest enemy is someone who's not even alive is the previous Mrs. The Winter Rebecca the name of the book, right? This woman is at the heart of Manderly. And her main mate is the one who runs the house. Her main mission is just keeping Rebecca alive in the house, doing the things that she liked, and hopefully driving away our protagonist. <laughs> Rebecca is a psychological trip in a gothic way. Like, don't expect an actual ghost being there. It's more like the idea of her. It's more about the power that the death can hold by those who try to keep them alive and especially someone like Rebecca like even if she's dead her personality just flourishes being dead it canonizes her it antagonizes her it makes her perfect and makes her angelic and makes her diabolic it makes her whatever you want her to be and that's why she is such an appealing figure if the story kind of rings a bell when you're reading it and you think of Jane Earl like I did just keep in mind that Bronte's book is named Jane Earl this book is named Rebecca and that means something so go ahead read it the style and writing is just beautiful if you are into long descriptive paragraphs brilliantly crafted Rose, just go ahead and immerse yourself and leave because the spoilers are here. Let's bring the spoilers. I love making videos with spoilers because I just feel liberated. I don't have to control every word I'm gonna say and that just feels so good. Let me begin with the house itself. Manderly. Manderly, not womenly or something like that, is an ancient house. It's been in Max's family for generations. It goes to the male heir. It's a manly state. Or so you will think. 
because honestly this house is pure Rebecca and that's problematic because Manderly is to Maxim what Maxim is to Mrs. De Winter so his wife is never his priority and maybe that's why his first marriage doesn't work everything that he does he does it for Manderly and the burning of it at the end just feels fair you know even when we root for him and for Mrs. De Winter to not go to jail and everything, he couldn't keep that house. It wouldn't feel right. Why so? Well, our narrator is in love with a killer. So we are automatically under the impression that Rebecca deserved it and that he's not a bad person. But that's a very bold move for the times that this is written. Even now, we are still very careful not to root for bad people in books and media, as I said in my previous video when I talk about you and Joe Goldberg because it brings the whole question of morality. Is killing good for in, ca in some cases? Should it always receive a punishment? Should people be able to get away with it if they are loved by someone or they are forgiven by someone? It is a whole conversation for another day, honestly. But in this book, everything would have been solved if status and class weren't a thing but they are. In a novel like Rebecca, names and reputation are everything. This is the center of the novel. Reputation, the reputation of the house, the reputation of Maxim, of Rebecca's, and how gossip just goes as quickly as it gets. The destruction of the house though, it is not the destruction of their lives, it's just about that reputation that Maxim is trying so hard to hold on to. And I think it can even be a critique about that lifestyle of those big old houses and status and how they actually don't matter anymore and how modernity was coming because in the movie the house being gone says Maxim free. The couple is happier without Manderly. Well, in the book, they seem to be lost without it and they seem to have lost their youth. Well, Mrs. De Winter's youth because Maxim was old to begin with. Also, it's interesting how the elements work in the story because Rebecca dies due to gunshot. But the real reason why is because her uterus is barren, dry, unproductive land. And the, the official story that they want you to believe is that she wanted to die and that that's why she pushes Maxim to killing her because she's barren and she has cancer and she's going to die anyways. Like that road that takes them to the beach that is contrary to the Happy Valley and the Happy Valley could be Mrs. De Winter and the other barren ugly one could be Rebecca's character and then you have the two roads. Then she is consumed by the sea or that's what you think until they find her body because Rebecca can never die. But <laughs> She rests in the sea by Maxim. That is strong and unpredictable like her. It suits her. She is like the sea. She is not like barren land. And then, of course, our next element is fired. We, well, we have Mrs. Damber. Who should have been fired. But whatever, the fire that consumes Manderly. So all these elements consumes the characters. Fire consumes Manderly. Barren land, barren dirt consumes Rebecca. And then her body is consumed by the sea. We will be missing wind in that part. But maybe the wind that brings the ship and then they discover Rebecca's body. But maybe that's just a stretch, honestly. But it is a good thing to think about those things. So let's just go to the characterization of our people. Mr. The Winter, Mrs. The Winter, Mrs. Danvers, Rebecca. Mr. The Winter in the book is like his name, The Winter. He's cold. I didn't fully comprehend why would she fall in love with him? Why would our narrator be mesmerized by this old, cold guy who had never tells her that he loves her, who when he proposes to her, calls her stupid and dumb and not in a cute Mr. Darcy way, I kind of insulted you because I'm very awkward situation. No, not at all, not at all. And then it's just rushed and suspicious. He never says that he loves her and it's not suspicious in the right reasons. Like it's not suspicious because he's a murderer. It's suspicious because he doesn't acknowledge any feelings towards her. But the movie knows that it's not gonna fly in 2020. Like no one wants to see that. Maybe it worked in 1938, but it's not gonna work in 2020. So they build us a romance in Monte Carlo. And the New Yorker <laughs> brilliantly said that they give us a perfume ad in Monte Carlo. It's just perfect Instagram feed with a guy that is not as old as you would have thought. 
if you only have read the book. However, while the married couple moves to Manderley, movie Mr. The Winter remains the same, while he would have had mood swings all the time, like in the book. It's okay if they wanted to give us a good romance at the beginning to make us fall in love with a couple and root for them, but then Mr. The Winter should have changed when he goes to Manderley. He should have been immersed with his own feelings, with his own thoughts, and ignore our protagonist, but he pretty much just remains the same. And he doesn't seem colder or with the weight of the murder that he committed. And with that, let's mention the murder scene. In the book, we see the scene through the eyes of Mrs. The Winter and her feelings, which is a very powerful lens because she is taken in a very particular way. It is important to her because he admits that he had never loved Rebecca and she is happy about it because that's all she ever wanted to hear. He gives her reason to condemn and hate her character and tells her that he never had any feelings for her other than hatred. Perfect for her. And the intention remains the same, but in the movie, it's super anticlimactic. He admits his crime without a lot of emotion into it. it. Felt bland to me because in the book, that's one of those moments when he stops being a rock and then he shows emotion and blows and it's all those feelings. And then Mrs. The Winter is the one who's just like very stale and she's thinking about it. And Mr. The Winter thinks that she's gonna turn against him and not love him anymore. It's a whole thing. But in the movie, that doesn't happen. And ugh, I don't know, it just feels very bland. I feel like the only thing I really like about Mr. The Winter movie guy was that close-up that they do with his face when he sees Manderly in flames. You see his face and then you see his eyes and then you see the house burning. His mouth is a little bit open and he like he can't believe it. And then you just remember that thing that he says at the beginning when he says Manderly is my life. It was all over his face. It was good. I don't know, again, his character is likable in the movie, but because of that change, they couldn't make him a dark element in the movie, like he was in the novel. This is important because in the book, Mrs. The Winter feels lonely all the time. She's like on her own and she kind of goes crazy. Let's do Mrs. The Winters now. My first commentary is just the lack of a first name. This goes to the movie and to the book, but I think it is important and it makes a statement in the source material because it can be taken in different ways, depending on what literary criticism you like. The first critique you can make is about class. Mrs. The Winter, is an orphan that works as a companion. Her condition as an orphan makes her family name irrelevant. Irrelevant. Because that name is not getting her anywhere. It is unimportant because it doesn't have the weight of an important position in society. This new bride is entering a space that she's not born for and that lack of first name demonstrates that. Unlike Rebecca, she is a stranger without any respect in Manderley because she has nothing to do there. She is originally one of the workers and not the lady of the house in the eyes of anyone, not even herself. Another angle is that she lacks a name because she lacks a spine. And that's something I've noticed in a lot of reviews for this book. We are with her the whole time and yet readers don't like her very much and they just want to slap her in the face. Slap her in the face. Face. Because we modern readers don't understand her passivity, which is rooted in that inferiority complex that she carries due to her class. She is the boss now and then she lets Mrs. Danvers bully her? You just want to scream, fire her, fire her! But it's not within her character to do that because she's not like that. Additionally, she never intended to marry Manderly as Rebecca did. She wanted Max. So she just assumes his name and we don't have anything else to define her. While Manderly is defined by Rebecca entirely. Lily James, the actress, as Mrs. De Winter might not have been the best option and this is not hatred toward the actress at all, but to her work, I didn't see the intensity and awkwardness and plainness that she was supposed to have. She is supposed to be feeling inferior the whole time Yet she walks around Manderly very composed. She doesn't seem like she doesn't belong. That feeling of being strange from the place that she is at is super important to the novel and I just didn't see it. Moving on, Mrs. Danvers. She is the agent of Mrs. De Winter's insecurities because Mrs. Danvers is always reminding her that Rebecca did everything better than she does. The iconic plot of the ball was well adapted in respects to Mrs. Danvers. But again, the most important scene of her that is at the balcony that was her moment of shine is so short 
and executed so poorly that it completely disappointed me. That was a key moment. That was a key moment that when I was reading, I believed that she was just gonna jump convinced by Mrs. Danvers. And then the ending of the movie when Danvers explains her motives of like burning the house down is so unnecessarily. And I would have left it as a book because we don't need it. In the book, it never even specifies that Mrs. Danvers did it. So it kind of leaves you guessing as you do all the time with her because we don't know anything about her other than she's obsessed with Rebecca. So leaving that as a mystery would have been great, but they just wanted to replicate the original movie instead of replicating the original material. A missed opportunity as a whole is that they were too afraid of antagonizing Mrs. Danvers too much and too afraid to suggest a sapphic homoerotic subplot between them. For example, when she tells touches Rebecca's undergarments and fabric. The movie does respect iconic quotes from Mrs. Danvers about Rebecca's usage of men for pleasure and she would have been happier if she would have been born a man because if a man did whatever that Rebecca was doing in London, no one will blink an eye at it because he's a man and women are supposed to stay at home all the time, right? But this idea is what strikes me because of course the novel is going to antagonize Rebecca's sexual freedom because of the times, right? 1938. But because also Mrs. Danvers is the only one that advocates for Rebecca's independence, the sexual liberation for women in this novel gets tarnished as wicked because of Mrs. Danvers and Rebecca's antagonistic nature. The truth is that Rebecca and Mrs. De Winters are the two historical stereotypes of femalehood. The Madonna and whore complex, which is rooted in misogyny and repression, places women in a spectrum depending on their sexual conduct and what it is conceived as morally correct or morally incorrect. Rebecca is condemned because she wants both, the pleasure and the status, because she does want manderly. She wants to possess the house and the status, not only the pleasure. And that's the card that she plays to have Maxim kill her because she pokes at him saying that she's gonna steal his house with her unborn baby and steal away his family house. She plays that card because she knows that Maxim cares way too much about all this stuff. So she is placed as a whore and the Madonna is Mrs. De Winters, her submissive, self-sacrificing figure that is rewarded in the movie but not so much in the novel and that's what Daphne du Maurier does better than the movie and all of you honestly because do we have a happy ending does Rebecca end in a happy ending are people happy there I don't know man honestly this is what I want to bring to discussion in the comment section in the novel Mrs. De Winters mentions to be happy and contempt when Mr. De Winter without a residence the book starts with that ending like the first chapter is about them after the burning of Manderley. And when I was reading that beginning without knowing anything about it, I believe that this was many years in the future. I believe that this Mrs. De Winters was an old lady married to an old guy in vacations or something, thinking about their ancient house, that she was missing that, that her marriage was just boring, like reading him parts of the newspaper, being his companion, while her only escape is thinking about Manderley. In the book, Mrs. Winter ends like she begins, without a permanent home and being an old person's companion. She just treated her formal old person for a new one that happens to be her husband. She ends as she begins in the book. Is that a happy ending to you? Is that a reward? for being a Madonna, for being submissive. In the movie though, Mr. and Mrs. The Winters are happier than they ever were. In an exotic place, having sex, being younger than ever before, which is honestly weird because in the novel, it is kind of implied that Mr. and Mrs. The Winters only had sex after that he comes clean about Rebecca making her the only highly sexual person in this book. While obviously in the movie, that couple doesn't have that problem, which would have been interesting in 2020 to see how viewers would have reacted to that. Because in our current times, we don't demonize sex that much, at least not heterosexual sex. So it would have been interesting to see how people would have reacted. The movie gives it a happy ending. That's it. And the book 
gives us manderly up in flames and the couple being bored with domestic routines. I don't know, what do you think? What is the relationship between sex and rewards at the end of the movie compared to the book? What do you think about Rebecca's sexual freedom and Mrs. De Winter's complete submissiveness? Does the conversation change from readers in 2020 to the readers in 1938? Or are we still in the 1940s and we just adore that Oscar winning movie? That's all. I'll be waiting for answers. I didn't talk about the aesthetics of the film, the costumes that were okay, angles or whatever. If you want to talk about that and you know about it or you have a more educated opinion than I do, please share it with us. I want to read it. And of course, I'll give you my opinion. Down below, I'm going to link the New Yorker's article that I referenced be before because I think it's kind of funny. And if you didn't like the 2020 movie adaptation, you should totally read that because they didn't like it either. Overall, the movie is okay. If it's a Sunday afternoon and you have nothing to do and you're just like chilling with your favorite green sweater and your sweatpants, it's gonna do the trick. But it's not memorable. And that's something that I need to state. It doesn't come close to the experience of reading Rebecca and all those plot twists. The characters seem flat in comparison to the source material. I wish just that their directors and producers and the writers or whatever would have been bolder. If I wanted to see the same movie from the 1940s one, I would watch that. This remake could have added more instead of subtracting stuff from the source material. It had the opportunity of being in modern times and exploring all the sides of sexuality and class and being separated from the historical time frame to really be a critique or something in that maybe Daphne du Maurier couldn't do because of the restrictions of her sex and her time. But it didn't happen. That's all from me. I'm sorry for the long video. I don't know how long it is, but it's probably super long. I'm sorry, but I'm also not sorry. I like doing these videos and I like speaking my mind. So Keep reading, follow me on my social media when you're not. I post almost every day on Instagram and I'll see you next time. Bye.